So our next speaker is uh, uh, Zhang Yu Chang from UC Riverside. And uh, he's going to speak about uh, model compression, uh, in particular from double descent to proving, uh, pruning uh, neural networks. Yeah, let me share my screen. Great to have you here. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Xiang Yu Chang from University of California, Riverside. Today, I will give a talk on our paper, Provable Benefits of Overparameterization in Model Compression. This is a joint work with my colleague, Ying Song Li, my advisor, Samet Omek, and our collaborator, Christopher Srampolidis from the University of British Columbia. The main, uh, main content of this talk is as follows. First, we will introduce the application and the motivation of model compression, which leads to the double descent phenomenon we found in the model compression process. The overparameterization of the original model can benefit the model compression. We have studied this phenomenon and proposed a theorem that can predict the, the performance of the pruned or compressed model. Our paper is basically about building efficient neural networks and uh, the recent state of the art deep nets are more attractive for us to conduct research in this area and improvements in efficient model is critical. Consider language model as an example. The recently introduced GPT-3 model achieves remarkable feats in language modeling, but it has more than hundreds of millions of parameters, which means it is difficult to deploy or train in practice. So if you can answer the question that how to build efficient models, we can actually do pretty good stuff. In particular, we can take an accurate successful model. We can smartly compress it down and build efficient model. And we can deploy this <coughs> efficient model in a wide range of scenarios such as smartphones and edge devices. The main goal of our paper is understanding fundamental principles of pruning and it is motivated by considering two scenarios. Option one, we can simply train a small model from scratch. And option two, we can do something a little bit complicated, which is <clears throat> I can first train a large model and then prune it or compress it and then retrain and refine it. That's actually what people do and what worked better in practice. And uh, the question is why? Why going from a large model to a small one is better than simply training a small model? Let's do some empirical investigation. In our experimental setup, we fix the size of the final model or the compressed model, which means the final model always contains the same number of non-zeros, but we grow the architecture of the initial model. We always prove it to have same number of non-zeros. This reveals a couple of interesting observations. The first one is large initial model helps. The best test error happens on the right side. And uh, the second observation is that there is a surprising peak in the middle in the shaded region. For a while, the test error climbs actually, and the peak is reminiscing us about the double descent phenomenon. That phenomenon is recently discovered in the study of dense neural networks, which is shown as the blue line here. <clears throat> the blue line corresponds to the performance of dense model, and the yellow one is the compressed Proven the model performance. This double descent phenomenon is studied by Belkin et al. and Nakura et al. as well as others, and it essentially shows the benefit of having large model on the accuracy as well as the existence of the peak. Our contribution as the first observation is that this double descent phenomenon is not unique to dense models. It arises even if you fix the final model size. Let's take a ResNet 20 model compression problem as an example. We increase the number of filters or widths in the ResNet 20 model in order to study the dense model performance, which correspond to the blue line. This one. Uh, 
And then we proven this dense model of different ways to a certain sparsity target. For example, sparsity target uh, equals to five means that the pruned model will have the same number of non-zeros as the dense model whose width equals to five. Despite the, uh, the different sparsity targets, we see that they behave a synchronous fashion. They exhibit double descent in around the same region and the double descent location coincides with the dashed line hitting zero loss basically, which is the interpolation point of the training loss. When the training error or training loss achieves zero, the model perfectly fits the data and the test error peaks. This situation was already observed for the dense models. There are several works provide exact expressions for the double descent. For instance, Michael Mahoney will talk about this. The question is, can we develop an insightful theory for the observations for sparse models? Let me introduce the theoretical setup, which is a quite conventional one. We have a data set with n samples according to some certain distribution. Very and uh, and uh, uh, obviously, ideally, we would like to solve um, population risk minimization, which is infinite n case. But since we do not have enough data, we do empirical risk minimization on finite sample risk. And importantly, we consider overparameterized setup where sample size n is less than model size p. It's easy to achieve zero empirical loss in this setup where focusing on quadratic loss and linear models or random features. So what is our algorithm? We want to minimize the empirical risks. Uh, we can do it in many different ways. But the minimizer we choose is the mean norm interpolator, which means we achieve zero empirical loss by interpolating data perfectly, and we minimize the L2 norm of this solution. And then we prune the beta hat to find the S sparse solution beta hat S, and then we can retrain with this identified non-zeros to obtain beta hat retrained S. In the second steps, we have considered different pruning algorithms. For instance, magnitude pruning, Haitian pruning, and oracle pruning. I won't dive deep in, uh, very deep into the introduction to these algorithms, but our theory are insightful for all of them. Here, Haitian pruning adjusts for the covariance information, and oracle pruning essentially knows the optimal non-zero support with respect to the test loss. In the following presentation, there are three parts. First of all, I will list our contributions. Then I would like to tell what predictions can our theory do. And finally, I will go to the main theoretical statements. The key contribution is we can characterize the distribution, uh, probability distribution of the mean norm least square interpolating solution beta hat. The reason we care about this <coughs> least square interpolating solution beta hat which works under an asymptotic region is because if we know the distribution of beta hat, it won't be difficult to know the compressed version named the beta hat S. And by studying the distribution of beta hat S, we can deduce when and how the overparameterization benefits the test accuracy. In short, all predictions will be a minor issue once we get the distribution of model interpolating solution. And uh, we extend the analysis to random feature regression and pruning. And finally, we provide insights on when and how retraining helps. Uh, a surprising result we get is re retraining helps when the, uh, features, uh, when the features are correlated, but not, not always be helpful. Let me show some of the examples. The first one is a linear Gaussian model instead of a neural network. Retraining is not involved in this example. We simply train a linear model and prune it without retraining. The sample size ratio n over p and the sparsity ratio s over p are fixed. Here, n is the size of data set, uh, p is the number of features, or we call it the problem size and the S is the compressed model size. In this way, we can adjust the problem size P. For the data set, 
we choose X to be Gaussian distributed, just like Mutukuma et al.'s work for over-parameterized linear model with Gaussian features. And the, <coughs> the data set S is of a spiked diagonal, spiked diagonal covariance. This idea is kind of related to Barton et al.'s work, but not overfitting, which show the relationship between near optimal prediction and, and the low effective rank. The choice of the covariance is arbitrary, but here we studied the, the spike feature covariance where some eigenvalues are, uh, or diagonal entries are large while the remaining ones are small. Uh, such approximately low rank covariance models are commonly used to understand the benefits of over parameterization. And we get the label Y by multiplying X with all one vectors plus the Gaussian noise with known level. In order to change <coughs> the model size as we've done in the neural network experiments, we don't use all P features in the data set, but only use the first P bar, P bar features by masking the remaining p minus p bar entries in beta to be zero. In this way, the model size will change with p bar from s to p. Mm. In short, we have a problem of size p, but solve it with model of size p bar. And finally, we obtain a compressed model of size s by various pruning methods. When we plot the task risk of a uh, test risk of many different solutions, beta head and the, their corresponding pruned version of beta head, this is what we get. We solve the final sample problem, plot the uh, empirical error with markers in the figure and compare with our theoretical predictions in solid lies. The first conclusion can be seen is our theoretical results fit the experiments perfectly. And uh, a second conclusion can be also obtained by looking at the growing model size. The spiked eigenvalue distribution corresponds to the latent saliency score of the indices. Thus, the indices are correspond to the best features. However, overparameterization indeed can provably help because it can be seen that the best test risk happens on the right side where the problem is overparameterized when we are uh, using all P features. Using more features can be helpful even if we are pruning the final solution and even if we can perfectly fit everything. Secondly, we consider random feature experiment. The original data is the row feature AI and YI. We obtain the refined feature XI by passing all AI through a 5W random feature map, which can be viewed as a first layer of a neural network with ReLU activation, which train prove and test with XIYI pairs, which is a random feature regression. And the uh, an interpre interpretation here is that random feature is a good proxy for understanding the neural nets because W can be viewed as the weights of a neural network and what we've done can be viewed as pruning the hidden units of the neural net. The result is shown in the right side uh, there, there is a very good match between what our theory predicts and what the markers correspond to the empirical ones. Blue is the uh, dense model performance where we were using all random features and red, red green, and teal lights correspond to different number of sparsified random features. This setup is like the first layer of a neural network is not trained, but only the second layer is trained and pruned. The previous conclusion still holds for this example. First, having large number of random feature works best and over parameterization helps. And second, our theory prediction still matches the experiment nicely. After demonstrating the consistency between the experimental results and our theory predictions, uh, I would like to start talking about our theoretical contributions. Just to recall the basic setup, we found the empirical risk minimizer beta head, and we want to say something about the pruned version beta head S. We do this by first, we find the distribution of beta head, then we can make conclusions about the performance of the pruned model beta head S, which is also a distributional knowledge. We will talk it about this step by step. The first step is 
given an arbitrary distribution of the data set, we would like to construct an equivalent Gaussian distribution. This idea is related to Karzakala's work. Um, this will allow us to use our theoretical results about the linear Gaussian problem to characterize the properties of an empirical risk minimization with nonlinear map. In other words, we convert a problem into a Gaussian distributed one. Given the distribution, we can construct some statistics such as feature covariance, global minima of the population risk and the noise level, which is the optimal population risk. <coughs> I'm sorry. Based on these statistics, we can construct Gaussian, uh, Gaussian data pairs, which is called XI bar and Y bar. By matching the second moment, second moments of the Y X pairs and the Y bar X bar pairs, solving the problems with original data set and solving problems with equivalent Gaussian data set will hopefully behave similar. This can be regressed to a certain extent using Motinari et al's results. This is the first step. The second step is identifying certain assumptions so that things work out. Mm, the first assumption is that we focus on a double asymptotic setup Double asymptotic means that both sample size n and model size p goes to infinity, but the overparameterization ratio kappa and the sparsity ratio, uh, sparsity level alpha equal to a certain value. Secondly, we also want the joint behavior of covariance and ground truth solution beta star to converge to a particular behavior. We assume the joint empirical probability distribution of beta star and sigma asymptotically converge to a certain distribution mu. In short, empirical measure is assumed to converge. The third step is, given this asymptotic distribution of beta star and sigma, we would like to predict the, the asymptotic distribution of beta hat, which is our solution. The basic idea of the following definition is quite straightforward. We define random variable pair uh, capital lambda and capital B correspond to ground truth solution beta star and covariance sigma and input the asymptotic distribution of them. Given this random variable pair, we can output <laughs> the asymptotic distribution of B hat, a random variable that associated with B, beta hat why there is a correspondence, you can see our main theorem. Suppose the problem is overparameterized, where kappa equals to n over p is greater than one. We have a mean norm interpolating solution beta hat. So the Lipschitz function f, we look at the empirical average of f over the entries of scaled beta hat, beta star, and sigma. We prove that this empirical average com converges in probability to the expectation of F over mm. capital B hat B and lambda. Through this theorem, it can be clearly seen that uh, the correspondence I mentioned before between beta star, uh, bet, uh, between beta hat and uh, B hat. In short, the finite dimensional distribution converges to an asymptotic behavior uh, given by the random variable b hat b and lambda. We care about this theory because f is pseudo Lipschitz function that involves a wide range of functions. f can be any function that helps us qu uh, quantify the desired property of the beta hat. In other words, our main results establish asymptotic convergence of the empirical distribution for a rich class of test functions. Specifically for pruning or model compression proposals, all we need to do is to pick F to apply hard thresholding or quantization operation, then calculate the loss function, rewrite the loss function in terms of beta hat, beta star and sigma. So F can reveal the test risk induced by beta hat. For example, we can take fx as z multiply y minus capital pi x square for risk prediction for different compression uh, methods. First, if we set capital pi to be identity mapping, 
the prediction will be used for the original mean norm solution beta hat, which is also discussed in Hasty et al's least square interpolation paper. Then if we set capital pi to be hard threshold pruning function, we can obtain the distributional characterization for the pruned solution. In our paper, paper we use this function to do risk prediction for both threshold based pruning and mag magnitude pruning by smartly choosing the threshold value t. You can find more detailed discussion in our paper in the above link. And uh, additionally, you can choose capital Pi X to be sine function, which correspond to binary quantization. There are many compression methods and we can simply do prediction by using this theorem. Okay, I would like to put an end to this talk by pointing out several future directions. First, our paper only focuses on pruning, but there are more compression schemes like quantization, distillations, etc., that we didn't cover here, but through the experiments and uh, the theoretical results, we believe that uh, overparameterization will benefit model compression. Secondly, these results can be extended to classification based laws such as max margin loss and can be applied to regularized learning such as ridge regression. Uh, we didn't cover the discussions here. Third, I think, I think retraining results in our paper can be further formalized so as I didn't cover in this talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. That was really, really, uh, yeah, that was really interesting. Uh, we have uh, we have at least one question coming in, uh, and uh, uh, Yao Dong, you have uh, I think you have permission to speak. So can you ask your question, please? Yeah. So the question is, uh, my question is, does the pruning algorithms, uh, different pruning algorithms, uh, will lead to different like risk curves? Like uh, uh, there's a lot, uh, tons of like pruning algorithms. Uh, Empirically, so uh, yes, of course. Uh, let me share my screen again. Okay, can you see this slide? Yes. Yes. So uh, there are uh, we have applied uh, for uh, we have applied different uh, pruning methods such as oracle pruning, magnitude pruning, and Haitian pruning on. Um, uh, this, for example, linear model. And we can see that they just behave uh, synchronous fashion. Yeah, so uh, can you further explain uh, what do you mean by, say, uh, different pruning, uh, uh, different task risk curves? Oh, I mean, uh, uh, I think all the curves, uh, the points as well as the curves, uh, the mm -hmm. curves are predicted by your developed uh, theories. But in practice, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, there are oh. two parts. There are two parts in in this uh, in this figure. Uh, the markers are only derived from the experimental results. That means we just. Uh, develop a linear model and trying to uh, solve some uh, uh, some uh, solve this uh, linear model without using our theorem and uh, the solid lie is what uh, what derived from our theorem so uh, since they are perfectly matched so perhaps you uh, you may think uh, they are coming from, uh, they are all coming from our theorem, but no, <laughs> the markers are, are empirical experiment results. Yeah. Okay, I see. Uh, we'll take a closer look later. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good question, good question. Let, uh, there's one more, let's do one more question. Uh, Hamid, I yeah. believe, and speak. Yes, <laughs> yes, so. So my question was, how does the performance of pruning, for example, compare with uh, training a sparse model from the beginning, for example, using less or any other method? So. Oh, uh, 
uh, we didn't cover this, but uh, our main results are uh, laying emphasis on uh, how does uh, how does the uh, over parameterization benefits model compression. So uh, so uh, there are uh, I mentioned two options of uh, of model pruning. The first one is uh, just training uh, training some small model from scratch. Does it uh, does it what you mean? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I yeah, think yeah, that yeah. would be an yeah. interesting yeah. experiment to like compare these two techniques. One is like, for example, add a regularization to train a sparse model and like do the pruning. I was just curious how these two things compare with each other. So, yeah. Mm, actually, uh, uh, since uh, the main topic is more about uh, how does over parameterization benefits the model compression? So we uh, didn't cover this, uh, yeah, this part in, in in our talk or paper. Yeah, I see. Thanks. Yes, yeah, but this are uh, good question, and I think that's uh, perhaps a future research direction to make comparison between uh, these methods. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much uh, again for the talk. Let's give a virtual thanks. <laughs>